Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessel Noor in Baltimore. On Sunday, South Africa's first black president, Nelson Mandela, was laid to rest in his childhood village of Kuno. More than 100,000 people visited Mandela's coffin as it lay in state over the past several days. Now joining us to discuss Mandela and his legacy is Danny Schechter. He's an author and filmmaker who first went to South Africa 40 years ago. He's made six documentaries with Mandela, and his most recent book is Madiba A to Z, The Many Faces of Nelson Mandela. Thank you so much for joining us, Danny. Pleasure. So Danny, how do you balance the role Mandela played as a unifying force against apartheid with the current economic situation that South Africa is in? Uh, we interviewed Glenn Ford um, after Mandela passed away, and he described a conversation with leading anti-apartheid activist Ronnie Casserles, who said that, South, that the ANC and the South African Communist Party chose to make it an unfinished revolution, a change in regime, but not in a change in the relationships of economic power. Well, for, first of all, let's, let's recognize uh, that Mandela was part of a collective leadership of the ANC. Everything that was done by the party was not done by him, and everything that he did was not necessarily supported at every stage by the party. He was a leader, uh, a visionary figure, and a, and a reconciler, a person who could reach uh, beyond the confrontation that was brewing in South Africa and avert a race war and, and, and uh, promote reconciliation at a time when no one thought that would be possible. So let's start with the positives. The positives is that apartheid was demolished, uh, that a multiracial government was formed in South Africa, that the country held its first uh, democratic elections in which everyone participated. That was largely part of his really forte. He was not an economist, and a lot of people in the ANC were rather naive about economics. They were being uh, promised all sorts of things by Western companies and Western governments that never came to fruition. But this was also a period when their allies, the Soviet Union, was, was basically had fallen apart and many of the countries that they had been aligned with were not able to help them. So in essence, they had to be pragmatic. They had to find a way to move forward uh, with as much support as they could achieve. Now, in the course of that, uh, they made deals which in, in retrospect and in hindsight don't look very good, deals with the IMF, deals with the World Bank, uh, deals with uh, various uh, companies uh, who were promising uh, to make changes but didn't really quite make them. Uh, Mandela was a, a, you know, a steward of all of this. He was a, a president, a political leader, but not necessarily the person calling all the shots in the same way that Obama is the president, but Wall Street calls a lot of the economic shots. So it's unfair to dump all of this on him. And what we do know, though, is that a the ANC, when it came to power, was more preoccupied with political change than with economic change. And I think the problems that we're facing in South Africa today and in many other countries are because movements for change don't focus on economics. They mostly focus on politics. So, Danny, in a recent piece you did in Truth Dig, you criticize um, the New York Times' Andrew Sorkin for writing about Mandela's infatuation with the freedom of markets. Talk more about exactly how these deals were struck and under what pressures, pressures the ANC and Mandela were when they took power in the, in the early 90s. I don't think the viewers of the Real News Network have to be persuaded uh, that there's an imperialist system out there, that there's a system of big powers dominated by a corporatocracy that really dominates our economic decision making. The ANC thought they were just fighting apartheid in South Africa. They soon learned they were up against the world system of economic domination, where what they wanted to do, which was transform the economy, end poverty, create jobs, uh, create schools, create other services, was handicapped for a number of reasons. One, the old government, the, the Afrikaner government, had actually stolen a lot of money. There was probably more corruption there than there has been since uh, the ANC took over. Secondly, uh, the forces of the neoliberal, say, elite, which, you know, I'm not being conspiratorial here, but I'm talking about the people who were advising the ANC, avoid demanding nationalization. It's not going to work. You're just going to create problems for yourself. Those voices 
were not just voices on the right. They included uh, China. They included Vietnam. They included many so-called socialist countries who were advising them uh, to try to negotiate and navigate some sort of middle path. And they thought they had, but in many ways, they were undermined uh, by pressure, lobbying, media attacks, uh, and, and all sorts of consultants and others who were trying to steer them in a neoliberal direction, and they were successful in doing so. But this isn't a simplistic process where there's a bunch of bad guys and a bunch of good guys. These were people who were grappling with a problem of how do we transform a country? Here's a man who came out of jail uh, just a, a few years before he was elected president. He wasn't involved in you know, negotiating on, on economic issues. He was trying to get his people out of prison. He was trying to stop a race war, neutralize the right wing, neutralize the, the armed forces of the uh, Africana military. And he was successful in doing a lot of it. But he wasn't, you know, he didn't have a magic wand and he couldn't uh, turn South Africa totally around. And the other thing is that this was not a socialist revolution. It was a national democratic revolution, as they call it. So it wasn't as if they had a clear agenda we want to do X, Y, and Z. And even the countries that had socialist revolutions, let's take a look at China, for example, have, have moved you know, in a market, market Leninist position, uh, really uh, building the market system. It's very hard to go against that uh, in, in the world today. And you know, as the reforms in Cuba show, as the reforms in, in, in Venezuela show, it's not easy to stand up against the combined economic power of the whole world. I'm not saying this to rationalize decisions that I think really should have been made differently, but that's me. What do I know? I'm in New York. I'm not uh, you know, on the front line of this battle. And there were major debates and discussions inside the ANC about what to do. And I write about that in my Truth Dig article, truthdig.com, uh, about how neoliberalism uh, pushed its way into South Africa. But you, know, you have to realize that this was part of... Uh, uh, you know, a struggle that people, there's a learning curve in every struggle. You start off wanting to do A and you end up uh, settling for B. And that's compromise. That's the real world, unfortunately. So it's easy to take pot shots at, at Mandela. And I don't. In fact, Jay Naidu, the person who ran the reconstruction and development uh, program in South Africa, who was charged by Mandela to uh, promote the transformation, said later, he said, it was not his fault. We, it's our generation uh, that dropped the ball here. And even Ronnie Casarels doesn't blast Mandela specifically. He's talking about, you know, the process of, of uh, a lack of uh, determination on the part of the ANT, ANC, which had been fighting for all those years to get to where they were. It was overwhelming. And they maybe underestimated what they had to do. But I think it's unfair to sit up here in the United States uh, and, and uh, you know, shoot some academic left-wing points at them when, in fact, they achieved quite a bit, but they were also restrained in what they could achieve. And, uh, finally, Danny, what do you say to critics who say that um, later on Mandela had the moral authority? He could have, you know, shaken the ground of the other ANC leaders as the inequality worsened, but he, he chose not to. Well, coulda, shoulda, woulda, okay? I mean... This is what I'm talking about. Your question really is what I'm talking about, is the assumption somehow that there were these clear options and that you could have gone for option A, oops, total revolution, option B, partial revolution, option C. You know, no, it, it wasn't like that. There were constant problems, constant crises that were going on, not only from external pressures, but internal pressures inside the ANC of people who, who needed houses, who needed salaries, who needed... Uh, you know, some sort of future for their families. And it was a lot of pressure on him from all sides. I think in retrospect, it's pretty amazing what he achieved. Uh, I would have liked to have seen him achieve more, but I don't think this playing this he sold out game, you know, really is, is, is appropriate, particularly a day after he's been put in the ground. I mean, I think we have to recognize uh, the tremendous strengths of this person. We have to recognize that the South African movement achieved so much more than any movement in America has achieved, as far as I can tell, in terms of uh, political power, in terms of uh, you know freedom and equality, in terms of a, a constitution uh, that's so much more progressive than our own. 
So <laughs> let's let's not get into this ga- this game of you know kind of zero sum game. Uh, I think there are contradictions, you know, in everything, and they were here. And I myself am an admirer of of Madiba. Uh, I'm somebody who understands what he was going through. I wasn't in the the rooms when a lot of those decisions were made, but I'll tell you this. He was a stand-up person. He stood up for certain principles. He took on popular stands. He believed in bringing people together, and he was successful in doing that. And I think the fact that so many leaders and so many people in South Africa came out to mourn his passing is a sign of how deep the respect for him was and will remain. And I, I think it's important for us in America to try to take a deeper look at this. That's why I wrote this book, Madiba A to Z, The Many Faces of Nelson Mandela. And I urge uh, folks who want to know more about this man and about this movement to read it. Thank you. Danny Schechter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for talking to me about this book and about uh, a man I think we all have to admire and all have to learn from both the weaknesses and the strengths. You can follow us at The Real News on Twitter. Tweet me questions and comments at Jessel Noor. Thank you so much for joining us. All right.